the uh, signal generator for multiple microwave applications. Good afternoon. I think uh, most of you know me for the, uh, the other one or two that don't. My name is Grant Hodgson, G at UBN. And uh, this afternoon we're going to talk about the first hardware module from the long running microwave SDR project, which uh, you may or may not be familiar with. But uh, hopefully by the next half an hour you, uh, you will have a bit more familiarity. A uh, quick background for those that uh, maybe don't know. The microwave SDR project was started, um, I think it was three years ago now, believe it or not. I described it in a reasonable amount of detail in 2007. Um, and at the time, it was really, this is where we've got to, this is what we're going to do next. Since then, there has actually been some uh, progress, although we haven't um, really told many people about it. And uh, this afternoon is an opportunity to uh, give you a bit of an update as to, uh, as to where we are. And uh, you'll actually see some shock horror real hardware. The real software was written years ago, and the hardware's behind the software. So, um, yes, our ACE uh, software engineers uh, sitting there thinking, come on, guys, I had this software written years ago. Where's the hardware? Well, um, we are getting there slowly. Gemma, <coughs> generator for multiple microwave applications or modern microwave applications, any number of acronyms is the first hardware module from the microwave SDR project. We decided uh, some time ago to concentrate on the 2.3 gigahertz band first. One of the reasons is there isn't a huge amount of activity on that band. Another reason is that the equipment isn't that easy to get. You can't buy an IC910H or a TS2000X with a 2.3 gigs module. You've got to use transverters. So, at least I think as far as I know you do. Um, so it felt like a really uh, a good sort of band. Um, another reason for 2.3 gigs is that it's the most fragmented band that we have in the world. Um, elsewhere, I've got a list of, uh, of all the sub-bands that are used, but it's, if you look at the different countries, so the EME guys have su uh, specifically know that uh, there's at least three different sub-bands used, and then there's a satellite band, the Australians have got their own band, and the New Zealanders have got another part of the band, and it's, it's completely fragmented. The microwave SDR project aims to cover the whole of the 2.3 gigs band in one go, and so for that reason it seemed like a, um, a reasonably good choice. We are developing, really honestly, we are developing a complete transceiver, transmit, receive, the whole lot. But there's a huge amount of work. There's three complete new modules have to be designed from scratch, the local oscillator, the receiver, and the transmitter. And in order to get the whole transceiver working, you have to have all three modules, of course. And so due to the fact that there is such a huge amount of work to do, um, it was decided to sort of break it up a little bit and let's get something out sooner rather than, um, rather than later. So we've decided to do the transmitter first. Uh, and Gemma is the first RF board from the, the microwave SDR project. So this is really just a subset of, the, uh, of what will be a much bigger picture. So what does this board do? It is a synthesized transmitter for either 2.3 gigs, uh, 3.4 gigs, or 5.6 gigs. Um, it won't be too long before there's a 1.3 gigs version as well. Um, you have to decide at the time of manufacture, which band you want. Um, one board will only do one band, but you can have um, more or less any band you like. We're going to concentrate on 2.3 first. 3.4 won't be far behind because it's uh, relatively simple. In fact, it's, just, it's literally component value changes to go from 2.3 to, to, uh, from 2.3 to 3.4. The 5.6 is a little bit more difficult and it requires more circuitry. Um, 1.3 gigs... Um, isn't too difficult either. One of the many features of the, um, the approach that we're using, uh, specifically for the uh, local oscillator, is that it has very narrow frequency steps. Um, we can cover the whole band, that is the band 2300 to 2450 in 10 hertz steps. I think in practice we could probably do 5 hertz steps if we needed to, but um, 10 hertz is good enough for anybody. 
it can be used as a, what I'm calling a true software defined transmitters, a, a true software defined transmitter. There's plenty of talk about SDRs, um, specifically on the receive side. Um, plenty of people are familiar with software defined receivers, um, albeit whether it's a little soft rock or something more sophisticated. Um, what we're doing with Gemma effectively is a software defined transmitter, and we're turning it around and saying the software is going to do all the work, but in reverse, and we're going to produce a nice transmit signal. A quick block diagram, if you can see that. I realize it's black on blue, and it's not the most, um, it's not got the greatest contrast, um, but if you can see that. Uh, it's the block diagram of a receiver, but in reverse. Uh, we start here with a digital interface to a PC. In this case, it's actually Ethernet, it's not USB. And then in a separate board, which I'll describe later, we have um, what I've called digital to analog converter. It's actually a little bit more than that, but in essence, that's all it is, uh, albeit a twin digital to analog converter. We have a couple of low-pass filters, and we feed these strange, mysterious signals called I and Q into a quadrature of converter, which is basically two mixers bolted together, fed with a common local oscillator, the local oscillator being on the transmit frequency. There's no, there's no significant offset, so we're not 144 megs away or anything. We're generating this signal at the frequency we want. And then simply fit in the resultant signal uh, into whatever gain stage uh, we choose. Low pass filter to get rid of the harmonics. And out we go. I've said 100 milliwatts. Um, 100 milliwatt mimics are readily available nowadays. It's easy to get 200 milliwatts, 500, 1,000 um, you know, watts. It's, it's not too difficult. It's almost arbitrary how much power uh, we, we produce on this. And the there's no real final decision, but it'll be in the order of, say, 100 milliwatts because it's so easy to do. And at the heart of it is the, uh, the synthesizer, um, which uses um, an LMX2486, which is a uh, rather grandly titled fractional N PLL phase lock loop. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time detail talking about the PLL, although I'm quite happy to answer questions on it. Um, this is a sort of slightly cut down version of the talk. Um, but it's the PLL, it's the fractional end PLL that gives us the ability to tune in very, very fine steps and give us whole band coverage and allows the thing to be locked to GPS and gives a fairly clean signal. The PLL is, uh, is really at the heart of it, and the PLL is, is the thing that um, ultimately determines most of the performance. We're also providing an onboard VCTCXO, another grandly named component, voltage controlled, temperature compensated crystal oscillator. And it's the VCTCXO that gives the stability and determines to a certain extent the tone, what the thing sounds like. Um, there's a number of options available for this. Uh, to a certain extent, um, you can sort of pay your money and take your choice. The uh, more you pay, the better the performance, the better stability. And for the ultimate performance, you can um, lock the thing to GPS, which is um, uh, available as standard. Uh, a lot of people have now got 10 megahertz references available. On the modulation side, um, the whole reason for using this rather complex and unusual IQ modulation scheme is that it allows us to generate literally any type of modulation we wish, whether it be sideband, CW, FM, AM, PSK, JT65, or some modulation scheme that hasn't even been invented or described yet, we can still um, generate it. It's, that's, this is one of the huge advantages of a software defined radio. Uh, the modulation is defined entirely within the software um, and the hardware is capable of literally producing any type of modulation. That could have um, potential use, for example, in spread spectrum um, systems which we're not using at the moment 
but if spread spectrum or some other digital means came along, the same hardware can be used with no changes or ideally with no changes. Um, and all you can do is change the software and you've got a new modulation scheme. You cannot do that with current existing um, hardware systems. In order to do that, uh, it requires these I and Q inputs, a baseband. Um, these are actually more or less the same thing. The, uh, the Q input is essentially the same as the I input, except it's phase shifted by 90 degrees, which, again, the phase shifting is done digitally entirely when a PC, or at least it is in this application. And to make it flexible, we've said the IQ inputs can be single-ended or differential. Um, Differential means that uh, the, you have two signals, one at a positive voltage, one at a negative voltage. There are some advantages in doing that, but many, um, I, uh, many uh, generators may be single-ended, so we can use that either. And we put some filtering on the board as well, as, uh, as needed. Uh, we've intended, we've tried to make the thing future-proof as possible. So... The main connector, I'll pass this around in a minute, is a 64-way standard um, 61, what's the number? 41612. These are used in buses and all sorts of other things. Uh, so it's a fairly standard connector. 64-way might sound a lot. Uh, in actual fact, most of them actually use most of those signals. There's a lot of grounds on there. Uh, we've got digital control, in, digital control signals. We've got analog signals. Uh, no RF signals, I might add. Um, just the control signals across there, power supply, lots of grounds, and a few, there's a few spares as well, for, uh, again, for future expansion. The uh, hardware is fully compatible with the microwave SDR project. So um, Gemma can be used like that as a single board on its own with no additional hardware. But you can also use it with a full microwave SDR back end as well, if needed. So again, there's future um, expansion built in. And in theory, this should be compatible with the uh, MBE21 uh, Beacon Engine project, which is uh, rather stalled somewhat, although it hasn't exactly died. Um, it's possible that you could use this same hardware with a different back end board and turn it into... Uh, something specifically aimed at uh, beacons. There's the PCB in detail. Four layer printed circuit board. You're not going to be able to etch this one at home. Uh, the, it doesn't show the construction there, but the, most of the, all the components are on side one. Uh, layer two, which is a short way down, is a solid ground plane. Layer 3 has got some power tracks, and layer 4 is a second ground plane. Uh, we couldn't do it all on two layers. I, I believe me, I tried. I tried laying this thing out on two layers, and it just wasn't going to work. There's just too much circuitry on there, specifically or particularly in the round of the, the area of the PLL and the IQ modulator. It just wasn't going to go on two layers, so it has to be on four. But four-layer boards are fortunately now readily available. There's a number of suppliers doing them for a small prototype build at reasonable price. So technology moves on, and uh, we're using that technology. Uh, the layout is uh, basically broken down. Obviously, that's the, the interface connector. The area here with a ground plane on the top side as well is the, the RF area. This is a BNC connector, or at least it's the pads for a BNC connector, which will allow the external 10 megahertz input if required. That's the onboard 20 megahertz VCTCXO. That little blue thing is a 10-turn multi-turn trimmer. That's the only adjustment on the entire board, and I'm working on seeing if we can actually get rid of that as well. That's the, um, yeah, that's the only thing there is to trim, and it just pulls the frequency on. This area here is basically determining the, um, the 20 megs reference frequency, a voltage regulators, another voltage regulator, 8-pin pick, which on this one wasn't fitted, probably still isn't fitted. No, it has been fitted since then. 8-pin uh, pick, one of the really cheap uh, 12F675, this one, I believe. And that's the programming connector, which interfaces to the pick. On the RF section, 
this rather large component here, which is half an inch square, is the VCO. This one runs at 2.3 gigs and rather conveniently covers 2.3 to 2.45 gigs. I think somebody at Zcom must be a radio amateur because um, I can't think of many other applications that would um, require exactly to cover an amateur radio band, but um, who, who cares, things available. This tiny little chip here is the PLL, fractional end PLL. Um, that has been probably the most difficult component I've ever had to solder in my life. It's an absolute nightmare. And if I was starting this from scratch, I'd probably use a, a different part because it's so difficult. But um, hopefully in the future, this will be mass produced on, um, you know, by machines. We won't have to worry too much about the soldering, but it is particularly difficult to solder that one. And then around here, we have various filters. Um, these resistors and capacitors form little RC networks on the power supply. Um, basically, out all, all this slot. In here is fed the 20 meg reference. Um, the VCO frequency, phase light loop does its work, sends a signal back to the VCO to keep the thing on frequency. The output is then buffered. There are pads, and I've actually fitted the components on this one. This is the 5.6 gigs doubler with a high-pass filter. Uh, that can just be bypassed if we're just doing 2.3 gigs. The signal then comes up to the IQ modulator. All this stuff around here, there's an op-amp, another op-amp. This is the, what I call the reconstruction filters, the low-pass filters, the I and Q signals. So we can take digitally sampled signals in here and uh, filter them, and we do lots of um, gain level shifting and a few other things to get the levels right for the IQ modulator. And then out here, another little um, buffer. These are uh, SOT89 packages, which are getting quite common now. We're not using the old um, micro X style with the output opposite to the input. Um, the SOT89 is, is quite a popular package now and gives some nice advantages. So these are just RF mimics, and we can easily get 100 milliwatts out of one of those. A uh, filter, which isn't fitted, and out we come up here to an edge mounted SMA connector. So that's, that's it in its, um, in its glory. I shall um, break the first rule of presentations and, um, and pass one round for you all to see. It doesn't matter if that one gets blown up with static. It, it really is literally a... Um, it's actually the first one I did, but I used it as a sort of space model for uh, photography and, and this kind of thing. So don't worry about blowing it up. One day, hopefully, I'll, uh, I'll get the chance to rebuild all the semiconductors and um, turn it into a real one. But... Um, can uh, have a look at that one. Oops. Okay, right, I'll show you the hardware. Um, this is the, um, the, the, the bit that I really, really like is the, is the, uh, the graphs of the performance. Um, this is the, the showing the output of the synthesizer at 2.32 gigahertz, or just under. That's the, uh, that's the marker at 23.20. This has got a span of 30 megahertz. We can see the carrier there, and what we can't see is any spurs. The PLL is clocking at 20 megahertz. Uh, somewhere down here, 20 megahertz away from the carrier, there is a tiny little spur, but we can't see it. And we can go 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, that's 80, 85. We can easily go 85 dBs down, and we cannot see a single spur, at least that offsets more than one megahertz away from the carrier. Uh, that's in stark contrast to uh, different types of uh, synthesizer, different PLLs, um, and other, other ways of doing it. Uh, this is one of the huge advantages of fractional N, is that it's, um, it, it's almost spur-free. There's just none of these horrible, nasty spur signals. Uh, if we look a little bit closer in, then the situation is slightly different. There is a spur. Here it is at an offset of 40 kilohertz away from the carrier. Uh, it's at a level of 64 dBs down. It's really not going to cause a problem at 2.3 gigs. Uh, there's a couple of other spurs as well. That, are, that one's 72 dBs down. That one's 76 dBs down. Uh, it's quite a... It's quite a clean signal. 
And uh, going back to the previous slide, um, this is why I'm quite keen on using PLL technology at 2.3 gigs. There are simply no other signals. We're not generating signals at 100 megs, multiplying and having to filter them out. There are no signals at all below 2.3 gigs. There are no subharmonics. And there are no spurious signals at, say, 3.5 gigs or something. Um, they just don't exist. We are generate, the only signal we're generating is at 2.3. Yeah, there's harmonics. Um, there's a harmonic at 4.6 and a second harmonic at 6.9. Those are just the filter. They'll be filtered out with a simple low-pass filter. Uh, and, of course, the antenna helps as well. But, you know, even um, just a simple filter will get those down to, say, 40 dB down, which is the same as current amateur um, technology. Um, this graph here, which I'm not going to dwell on, but I will come back to if required, um, shows the all-important phase noise. The, you can tell an awful lot from these plots. Um, the way I think of these plots are a bit like um, X-rays or MRI scans or CT scans. Um, you look at the thing and, and it really requires a doctor or a specialist to point out that where the problems are. Uh, if you don't know what you're looking for, it is just meaningless. But um, for someone who looks at these things all day long, you can actually determine an awful lot of information from that. Um, this was measured directly at 2.3 gigs and uh, consequently the, in, in the areas of um, here and here, what we're actually doing is measuring the spectrum analyzer phase noise. The, um, the Gemma synthesizer is so good that it's actually below the noise level of a, a actually quite a good spectrum analyzer. In this region here, where we can see a phase noise of about... 88 dBc, and it's this region here that determines the, um, the quality of the tone. Uh, I can come back to that if, uh, if anybody wants to um, discuss it further. Uh, what we can do now is listen, he said, with the um, aid of a mouse. We can actually listen to the thing and see what it sounds like. Or at least we could earlier. Do we have any um, sound coming from this? No. Right, what I'll do is I'll post it on a website. Um, it works on the laptop, but it won't fill the room. I guess this just isn't going to... Uh, you know, the sound out from the, the PC is not connected to the, um, the speakers. Um, I'll have to put it on the website and, uh, and let you listen to it yourself, or you can listen to it on the laptop afterwards. Um, to me, it sounds perfectly acceptable. Uh, the one on the left is the 2.3 gigs, and just this week, David G6GXK has uh, done a recording of the signal at 5.6 gigs, which um, to me sounds um, perfectly acceptable. The, one of the interesting things about Gemma is that there are several modes of operation. It can be, it can be used standalone with nothing more than a single power supply, 12 volts, uh, going in at one end and RF coming out at the other end. In that case, the onboard pick does everything you need to set up the synthesizer. If you wanted to be really, really clever, you could probably arrange it so that it um, can probably do some simple modulation as well. But certainly it's capable of generating a CW tone with no extra hardware. Or you can connect it to a PC using an RS-232 port. Um, David G6GXK is doing some work on that. I'm not quite sure how far that's progressed. Um, but again, because we're using a PIC, the PIC can implement a very simple serial port. And using a simple program like Hyperterm or whatever you use in Linux, you can say set the frequency to 2320.0. 905 to think one frequency and the synthesizer will jump to that frequency from, uh, from a PC and then you can unplug the PC, walk away and just leave it and it will stay there. At some point in the future uh, it should be possible to add USB although it is somewhat more complicated, it's going to require a different pick but of course 232 ports are getting much harder to get hold of nowadays and um, everything's on USB so 
we've been offered some help to, uh, to put a USB port on there, and that would certainly um, enhance the functionality. Yeah, that's pretty much plus all the software and the drivers, at, at which point it goes completely outside of my sphere of knowledge, and I, you know, I just don't know how you get the drivers to work. And, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to go there. I'm just going to get, get someone to do it. We've already got a volunteer. Um, I just don't know how USB works. And uh, to be honest, I haven't got the time or the inclination to sort of get involved. So um, it, we're going to get a volunteer to, uh, to implement that and see how well it works. The, uh, another means of um, operation is to connect it to an MBE21 controller. I would add that uh, there's a slight problem in that the MBE21 controller doesn't exist. But if we can um, uh, ignore that slight uh, technical problem, uh, you could use the thing as a microwave beacon. The MBE21 controller would have the, uh, the software and the hardware on it to generate the IQ signals, which would generate uh, on-off key in, FSK, all the call signs, QRA locator, all the other things um, that we expect from, uh, from beacons, and quite possibly a whole load of other stuff as well. And the final one, uh, the same board without any additional hardware or modifications can be connected to a micro SDR baseband stroke controller board, which does exist, although well, I haven't got one with me, uh, in which case you get full functionality from the, uh, the micro SDR uh, suite of uh, programs, which I think we can come on to later. If the Gemma board is connected to a micro uh, micro SDR back end board, then you do have a true software-defined transmitter. The graphical user interface for this has already been um, written and tested and used, and QSOs have been made on the air, albeit at uh, slightly lower frequencies. Um, you can, you know, we, we can generate sidebands, um, AM, FM, CW. You've got a tuning knob. You've got RIT. You've got a whole load of, um, of other stuff as well. Um, I'm not sure if we can demonstrate that today, but uh, certainly it's been demonstrated before. Um, all you've got to do is plug the board in, and uh, you've got yourself a full uh, software-defined transmitter. I would add we haven't designed the receiver yet, um, but you've certainly got all the transmit functions. A uh, quick look at what is on that board. Uh, well, it's not really part of this talk, but um, here's the, uh, the digital-to-analog converter that I mentioned, which required for the, uh, the transmit giving out the, the IQ signals. Perhaps not surprising, there's a CPU on there, albeit a very powerful one, a 60 megabits, uh, megabits per second um, risk CPU. Ethernet interface to a host PC. A few control lines, and we've also implemented, implemented a very high performance um, receive analog to digital converter, which will be used for the receive side. That's the baseband board, it does exist. Um, that's the only one in the world, and it's uh, right now sitting in Germany. Um, hasn't yet been mated with the Gemma board, but it's, um, it's certainly uh, something we plan to do in the not too distant future. Um, on there is the, that's the A to D on receive, that's the CPU, that's the Ethernet, that's the mating half of the 64 way connector. Uh, there's a little crystal, um, I think that's the D2A, but I'm not sure. And I think there's some components on the other side as well. That, funnily enough, is actually laid out on two layers. Um, Tobias, who designed that, did a remarkably good job on getting onto two layers, considering there's 100 pins on this, um, on this CPU. But um, it doesn't require a ground plane, whereas RF boards uh, work much better with a ground plane. So that's the reason we went to four layers, and the, the baseband is still on two layers. More features of the, of the Gemma system. Uh, we've implemented, or there will be implemented, a lock detect feature. If the phase lock loop, for any reason, decides it's not very happy and jumps out a lock, or it can't lock, then it will automatically disable the transmitter, the stopping operation on um, frequencies outside the band. Uh, it can be enabled or disabled externally, which is uh, effectively a PTT feature. The external reference signal will be automatically detected. The intention is that the micro SDR hardware 
both the RF board and the baseband board, the whole lot is mounted at the masthead. So gone will be the days of running huge amounts of uh, thick, expensive, low-loss cable uh, per tower. One of the options with microwave SDR is to mount all the hardware at the top. And then you run up, say, it's Cat5, Cat6 cable, very thin Ethernet-type cable at the mast instead of coax. You would need to run the reference up to the top, but that's simple. That's only 10 megs. Use RG58 for that. Um, if the reference should fail for any reason, then that will be detected, and the thing will seamlessly switch to the internal VCTCXO, flag the user, but it won't stop. It will just keep going on. And OK, you may be off frequency slightly, but it won't be the end of the world. Uh, there's all sorts of features in software that allow various um, status things to be interrogated. Uh, we've implemented a serial, um, across that 64-way connector, there is a serial bus. And uh, we can get the two microprocessors to talk to each other and uh, find out what's going on, should they need to. And uh, that's about it for me today. Uh, once again, the usual slide saying... Um, this is a team effort. There's, there's no one person being involved in this. There's at least uh, three or four members of the team here today. Um, if anybody's interested, we're always um, trying to recruit people to help us. Um, mechanical designers, software, RF, baseband, documentation, web. Um, you don't need to understand the ins and outs of fractional end PLLs in order to, to make a contribution. There's um, all sorts of... Um, ways in which anybody can help, and uh, we're all doing this in our spare time. It's a, an open hardware design, open software design. Uh, we're, we're literally giving this design away to the community. It's not as though there's going to be a, a huge commercial gain here. Um, and the idea is to sort of promote the state of the art and, uh, and make this available to as many people as possible. That, for those that haven't seen it, is the, is the graphical user interface. Um, this is the last slide. Uh, I haven't, that, that's not a working demo, but it certainly shows you the, um, what the software that Jonathan's written uh, sort of looks like, or at least what the graphical user interface looks like. It's based on a, I think it's the IC706? Yeah. IC706, nice, simple user interface. In stark contrast to some of the other user interfaces you may see on some of the HF radios. Um, personally, I quite like this. I quite like the simplicity of it. Um, behind this menu button, there are all sorts of um, options. Um, and by putting it behind the menu button, it keeps it out of the way. It means you don't have to sort of clutter the front panel. But everything you need is there. You've got a nice great big display giving frequency down to 10 hertz. You've got the usual pan adapter, whatever you want to call it, band scope, classical S meter, uh, tuning knob, uh, RIT, um, volume, mic gain, power, um, you can see for yourself, you can, it's very, it's very simple to use um, and the intention is that we'll interface with things like Griffin PowerMate at some point if you like the idea of an external tuning knob. So that's the, that's the front end and that's the, uh, the graphical user interface you would use with the, the, the baseband board to give you the full microwave SDR experience. That completes the, um, the talk for today. Okay. Uh, any questions? I'm more than happy to um, try and answer them.